Washington City Council meeting of October 16th, 2014. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I will be presiding tonight. Um, and actually, now I feel, uh, you know, we've required that all public meetings that are televised, that we announce that they're televised. We always, I always felt that that was sort of presumed given the <laughs> array of cameras, but just to be safe, so everyone can understand that uh, by sitting here and speaking that you are consenting to be recorded for posterity and these video documents actually count as minutes of the council meeting. So there, I've completed my uh, duty in that respect. As, as uh, is our custom before we convene, uh, we uh, open the mic up to the public to speak on any topic of their choosing. Yeah. They um, conform to a sense of decorum and uh, keep their comments under three minutes. There will be a timer sometimes. There's Joan Rivers. Um, <laughs> Joan Rivers. <laughs> she died. Um, oh. the, uh, uh, when you step up, please identify yourself by uh, and uh, give us your address. And, um, and understand that the counselors, uh, by our rules, are not allowed to respond. They will listen and take note of what you say, but if you ask them a question, it will just be met by awkward silence, which is rare in a city council meeting. So um, that said, we'll start with the public comment. And first up is Ellis Smolensky, please. Good evening, City Council. My name is Ella Smolenski, and I live in Florence, Massachusetts, as you know. Um, I'm here this evening to talk about a very wonderful opportunity we have. We have a very exciting opportunity. You know what that is? We can elect Martha Coakley as governor of Massachusetts. We have a woman who, with a proven track record as an attorney general, who's quite educated, a graduate of Boston University, and hails from Western Mass. Does it get any better than that? So why I'm here this evening is to talk to you about her mental health plan, which I'm sure you may all be familiar with. Her brother Edward lived with depression and bipolar disorder. Uh, her brother committed suicide, as you probably have heard about. Martha is, feels very strongly that mental, the mental health system needs improvement. She has a written mental health care plan. She feels that we need to eliminate stigma and improve the delivery of services. She feels very strongly about this, and I am asking you to call everyone you know, every person, that's what I've done, everybody I know across the state, and get out the vote for Martha Coakley. We can do this, we can elect someone. Martha is a driven person. She is a, she's a, going to be a strong advocate for us. I just hope that you're with me on this. I hope that you get everybody out and vote for her. We can be very proud that we have this woman running. And in closing, I'm going to say vote November 4th. It's your wonderful opportunity to get out there. And please uh, help me to elect Martha Coakley for governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Jasper Lapiensky, please. Good evening, and uh, just for the record, I'll state that I uh, will not be voting for Martha Coakley because I think she's a fool and an idiot, and I can't wait until we have another smart governor like Paul Patrick. But anyway, what I want to talk about is uh, back in July, this is my first ever handwritten public comment, so you know. Um, back in July, as the issue of Phragmites at Fitzgerald Lake came to the forefront, I ignored it because it wasn't my issue. But after hearing the discussion, I was eventually persuaded that not only was it a bad idea to poison sensitive wetlands in order to save them, it's not unlike bombing Iraq to free its people, uh, but also it's impossible. You cannot achieve 100% removal of most invasives. Even if you could, it will likely come back. That said, with an 8 to 1 vote in favor, I stepped back. The council had spoken. Let's see what time would bring. But I felt that we needed to have some accountability, so I sent an email to the Broadbrook Coalition requesting that they, requesting the name of the company doing it, when they planned on doing it, and some other information. <coughs> Based on the confront, confrontational and unclear language of the reply from Bob Zimmerman, uh, it suggested to me I could not deal with him directly. Instead, I asked a member of this body to act as the go-between and was able to get a promise from Zimmerman secondhand. 
I would be notified prior to the application of the herbicide. I gave no reason why. I simply wished to keep the public and the government in the loop. This past week, I was forwarded an email by my counselor. Without even informing the BBC, let alone the council or the public, the company tasked with poisoning our environment on purpose had gone ahead with the mission. I repeat, the company applying the herbicide did not even inform the body which had hired them, which was also the body tasked with preserving the land. Beloved counsel, this is ultimately where privatization of the public sphere leads. A quasi-governmental bodies giving private corporations carte blanche to tailor the environment to their liking with or without our consent. This is problematic for many reasons, obviously, but it is troubling most of all because, as it stands, no one, before, during, or to this day, ever bothered to check up on the site to see if the plants have been killed, any damage was done, or even, in fact, if the herbicide was applied at all. I presume it was, but we don't know. The Board of Public Works is already clamoring for another series of herbicide applications all over Northampton and Hatfield. Can we please take a step back for a moment and ask ourselves, what will it take for us to start paying attention? A three-eyed fish? A sudden vanishing of bald eagles from the Pioneer Valley? A canoeist suing the city for, for ER costs? I'm not even saying we shouldn't ever consider herbicides, but when we do, we ought to make damn sure they are done properly, safely, and with maximum oversight, which right now we are not. Thank you. Spot on. Thank you very much. Um, that's all we have signed up. Is anyone else interested in speaking at this time? Well, in that case, I will ask the secretary to call the roll, please. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor White. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shira. Here. Councilor Spector. Here. We have a quorum, so I will call this meeting to order. Um, first up, we have a public hearing announcement. This is the announcement of the tax <coughs> classification hearing. Uh, it will be November 6, uh, 2014, here in the council chambers uh, during, uh, during the council meeting at 7.05. Um, and that is where we essentially determine the classification of taxation, how it is divided among commercial and, and home ownership and there will, I understand there's going to be a discussion of this effect in, uh, in finance and a finance committee, a special convening of the Tuesday finance committee meeting to discuss the various options that are available. Um, so be apprised and attend if you're interested in uh, contributing to that conversation. Uh, next up is the, is communications from the mayor and he made it, he Probably didn't travel the speed limit on the mass term. Certainly Mike, but did. I I'm not going to hold I observed all the laws of uh, Northampton. <laughs> uh, so I am pleased to be with the city council again tonight, two nights in a row. This is, uh, this is good. And I have a proclamation that I wish to issue tonight um, entitled National Disability Employment Awareness Month, um, October 2014. Whereas the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, was signed into federal law on July 26, <coughs> 1980, and whereas the ADA ensures the civil rights of people with disabilities, establishing a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against individuals with disabilities, and whereas currently 56.7 million persons live in the United States with disabilities, ranging in physical conditions affecting mobility, sight, hearing, and speech, as well as learning disabilities, and whereas all persons deserve and have the right to an accessible workplace, accessible schools, public spaces, and an accessible community. Now, therefore, I, Mayor David Jane Arkowitz, do proclaim October 2014 to be National Disability Employment Awareness Month in Northampton and encourage the fostering of a disability-friendly, barrier-free community I reaffirm our goal to work toward full equality and inclusion of people across the broad spectrum of abilities. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the city of Northampton, Mayor David J. Narkowitz. And I believe we have a city. To, uh, Tori, Tori Eklund is yeah, here, Tori chair Eklund. of the. Uh, <coughs> uh, exactly. 
chair of our uh, commission, uh, Dis commission on Disability is here this evening, and I'd like to formally uh, present this to you and to thank you and the members of the, uh, of the Disabil Commission on Disability for all the work that you do, not only uh, during this month, but throughout the year to advance uh, access. Thank you so very much for your support. The podium is yours if you want to. Okay. Think. You're welcome to speak, Tori. <coughs> I just want to thank you all for your support um, on behalf of the Northampton Commission on Disabilities. We work very hard to make the community aware of the needs of people with disabilities and this means so much to us that to have this support and have all of you behind us in the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. And Your Honor, is that it for your uh, yes, it is communications? Right. All right, next up, uh, one minute announcements, which I don't want to pass up yet. Um, thank you. On, on Sunday, uh, this Sunday, October 19th, from 4, excuse me, from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, uh, will be the <coughs> annual Ward 3 Neighborhood Association uh, meeting. Uh, it will be held at the fairgrounds. Uh, and you get to it through the Fair Street entrance. And it's an annual event where you get to meet your neighbors and learn about the work of the Neighborhood Association and some of the issues in Ward 3. And it's a really good time. It's open to everyone, whether or not you're a Ward 3 resident. Uh, so please consider attending this Sunday. Another one. I, I think I'll use the opportunity to, to follow up on your mentioning of the fact that the the finance committee uh which theoretically meets i think the third tuesday of every month um, we do most of our work here in council to share that with everybody that's here on the 21st susan right i think is the 28th okay the 28th so the last you that was the third but it's the last one the 28th extra week this month. extra week yeah the 28th of the month at five in this room right here We'll be having a, a meeting to review, and, and many of the counselors, this might be your first classification hearing, um, some of the options. We've talked about this for, before for counselors who've been here before. There are other options to us that we could adopt that in the past we felt didn't really apply themselves to the city of Northampton, but would take a, a moment to look in more detail at those where we're not voting on it that night. Uh, if you, I would recommend for new counselors, perhaps you want to try and come five, the five o'clock meeting on the 28th. And Susan Wright is going to do a presentation to us of the different options that will be afforded to us at the classification hearings and why the finance department and the assessors recommend a certain course of action uh, and have the time to actually think about it before we actually have that hearing and you're called upon the vote on it. So. I just thank you. Thank you for doing this. I, it, I, th I think this has to do with um, my request and I think other counselors to, to just discuss some of the different classifications from last year and I appreciate that. Well, I can remember in the past several times we've said, you know, we should look in, in with more detail to what we, is it like an obligatory thing we do every year. And uh, this is a good way to do it, I think, and to use that off finance meeting as a forum for counselors to. So please come if it's of interest to you and you've, you've not ever done a classification hearing before, come. We'll explain the options and, and why the assessors and the finance department recommend what they do every year. So, um, And I would add to that, if you have a commercial interest in the city of Northampton, you may be interested in attending and understand that to date, Northampton has not burdened or not put a greater onus on commercial properties as some other communities have in the past. So. And, and I do want to point out to the public, this is a public meeting. Yes. So while we are encouraging the counselors to come, anybody can come if they want to have a better understanding of, you know, what the classification hearing is and, and, and why finance and the assessors recommend what they do. So anybody can come at all. It's not just for the counselors. Any other one-minute announcements? No Halloween events? You, nothing. Okay. <laughs> all right. Then we'll go on to, um, we're up to uh, the second reading on the resolution condemning violent acts. <coughs> and and this will be the second reading as amended. And the council on October 2nd, 2014. Is there any interest in a rereading of the resolution? I knew you'd say that. And let's see. 
get my copy here. Because I can scroll down to it. <laughs> it's behind you. It's behind me. It's up there. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you, Counselor. This is um, this is upon the recommendations of uh, Counselors William Dwight, Jesse Adams, and Marianne Labarge. Um, uh, whereas the most elemental tenet of a successful and just community is the necessity for people to live securely and to respect differences. And whereas the ability of a community to thrive and flourish is threatened when violence or the threat of violence is inflicted on any citizen or citizens because of their identity and or how they are identified by others. And whereas recent acts of vandalism in Northampton have been committed upon emblems of distinct political cultures, i.e., the theft of, <clears throat> excuse me, the rainbow flag from Jackson Street School and the attempted burning of the Israeli flag at the congregation B'nai Israel. And whereas both of these institutions strive to promote open, respectful discussion of complicated and challenging issues, and whereas these acts of vandalism are expressions of contempt and are implicit and actual violence, and whereas these acts are an anathema to the citizens of Northampton and are counter to the goodness to which they aspire, and therefore be it resolved, now therefore be it resolved, that the City uh, Council of Northampton vehemently condemns these recent criminal acts and all other malicious actions that are designed to promote fear and discourage, and discourage civil discourse, and be it further resolved that the City of Northampton calls upon all citizens to express their courage and hope by engaging in respectful debate and discussion with one another and by supporting the people who have been threatened. Move to approve. Second. Questions have made in second and for second reading. Is there any further discussion <coughs> on the resolution? Um, uh, Councilor Klein, sure. So I, um, I voted for this in the first reading, and I feel like I need to kind of pull apart some of the, uh, the things that are implicit in this, um, this piece of legislation. I condemn all acts of vandalism, all acts of violence. I think that um, there is no reason for anyone to burn somebody else's flag. However, I do feel like burning of flags is um, political expression in and of itself. And I think that um, one of our whereases here that talks about um, this act of vandalism being an expression of contempt, I think that it's, um, I think that's true, but I think it's an expression of contempt that we also need to look at in terms of um, what motivated it. If in fact we can, we can assign some kind of motivation to this act, um, I think that the context is is that um, a war on Gaza that Israel was perpetrating killed over 2,000 people. Um, I think that there are people in this community that care a lot about that and really care about um, freedom and justice for Palestinians, and I support that cause very much myself. Um, so I just, I think that we can't um, just see this as a hate crime. I think we need to understand it within a context. Um, I want to say again that I absolutely condemn um, vandalism. I absolutely condemn the idea that somebody would burn somebody else's flag, but I do think that we need to um, kind of think about the expression in this resolution that says that this was necessarily um, a hate crime. I, I'm not sure that it was a human rights issue. I think it was an ex a po political expression of anger about um, acts of the country of Israel, and I think that that is a very justified um, expression of anger. Councilor Adams? I, I agree with some of that somewhat, but I do think it's also to point out that this wasn't done in a, in a public space, or, or like the school was, but with this, with looking at the burning of the Israeli flag, someone trespassed to a, un, onto a place of worship, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and in the other instance, someone, someone uh, came to a school and, and, and stole a form of expression. So it's not as if this was in a, in a, in a, in a, in a public forum where, um, you know, where freedom of speech um, is welcome in, in most forums and, and did a, a legitimate protest to what was going on um, in Israel in, in the case of the, the burning of the Israeli flag. Or, you know, I, I don't know what the purpose of, of the stealing of the rainbow flag was, but I imagine it's nefarious. But I can't help but think that the burning of the Israeli flag was certainly nefarious, 
And, um, and I think it's important to realize that those weren't done in limited public forums where certain forms of free speech are, are acceptable um, and certain acts are acceptable as forms of free speech. And, and I, I should, if I may, I was the drafter of this, so I should like to, first of all, there, um, and in fact, I qualified this last time when I presented, uh, did not include the language of hate crime, because insofar that we do not know the motivation in either case, because we don't know who did it or what compelled them to do that. It didn't seem appropriate to condemn them based on, uh, and, and a lot of this leads to presumptions. It, the, the resolution speaks more to the effect that it had on the peoples to whom it happened to. Um, relative to uh, free speech, I, I agree, actually. I do agree that, but there is a difference between me burning a flag and someone else burning my flag. Um, because we're, when we have these semiotic debates in Northampton, and we have them a lot, which is, I think actually speaks well of us for the most part. I mean, the fact that we discuss a color scheme for crosswalks as it relates to the symbology, the, the value and the potency of these symbols and how they're interpreted. But I, I, I was assiduous in crafting this in so far as to say, in the, in the absence of understanding and knowing the motivations behind both these acts, the more relevant thing was the perception of assault on properties, as Councillor Adams said, on properties that people um, have a right to feel secure within those properties. So that's, I mean, and, and you and I don't differ on, on many points in this, and, but that was not the intent, nor is it even in the content of the, of the resolution. So I want to be clear on that. Uh, Councilor Kern. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Klein, I, I really um, appreciate your bringing, bringing up this uh, particular matter. And in, uh, uh, like other councilors have said, uh, I, I agree that um, there are certain contexts in which burning of the flag in a public protest, for example, we saw many of the public protests on Friday evenings, uh, a burned Israeli flag marching down the street would be a very different matter than a clandestine act undercover at night belong to a flag that belonged to the institution, um, which I, I, I do agree was much more of an, an expression of um, it, it had more implicit violence than it would in a public display in a public form of expression such as the street protests that we saw all, all summer. Um, and I really supported those uh, sort of supported those expressions of protest as they were happening. So I guess I draw the distinction between these kind of acts of covert uh, destruction and vandalism and um, I can see that the people <coughs> who, who are members of that congregation and whose flag was actually taken and burned, or the, the school of children at, at Jackson Street where their flag was stolen, um, really felt the, uh, really felt threatened by that. So it's, I find it an appropriate resolution in that regard. Thank you. Any other, uh, Councilor Klein, is there language in here in this edited version that you feel um, still indicates that we're considering this a hate crime or something like something. What what specifically is still troubling you about the language? Um, unfortunately, can I be recognized? Yes, <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, no, the question, I um, the question was directed at you. Yes. I I uh, I'd have to kind of read this much more carefully and dissect it. I think to really pick up. I think that there um, there are implications within that are I do find troubling I think that um, you know there are acts of vandalism of all kinds but we don't as a council rush to um, craft a resolution to condemn them and the fact that we are crafting a resolution in this case is um, I think it has implications that we need to be thinking about more deeply before we pass something like this um, and I would have to really pull apart the language, and I really regret that I didn't take the time to do that before the second reading today. Um, it, it's a good question that you're asking, and I wish I had a simple answer, but I, I would need to take more time to do it, and unfortunately, I didn't. Any other comments, discussion, Yeah, well, I, 
I mean, I think we can make the case for the fact that someone may have <coughs> stolen the rainbow flag from the Jackson Street School because they thought it would look pretty in their dorm room. I mean, we, we can make a case for the fact that perhaps there was no evil intent in that beyond, gee, this would look nice hanging on the wall in my dorm room. Uh, but going to a place of worship and, and burning a flag, that, is, that passes muster as a hateful act for me. Um, you want to make a statement, write a letter to the editor. You don't go to somebody's place of wor worship and basically desecrate it in that way. If your feeling is such that you have to make a statement, there are better ways to do it than that because making a statement to that congregation in this city for an international event I think is a little inappropriate. So I don't have any problem with that part of it. I can maybe make a case for the fact that the rainbow flag wasn't a hateful act. It might have just been a college student thinking, gee, this is pretty and I want it in my room. You know, I don't know if anybody here ever swiped anything when they were in college because they thought it would look good in their dorm room. Um, but it happens. But I, I think going to the shoal and burning the flag is, can be considered a hateful act and I don't have any problem with that. I guess I'm not, I'm not so politically correct that I have a problem with that. I think one of the issues, I mean, this is a very um, systemic and deep conversation that we could have um, but I think that the conflation in Jewish communities in the United States of the Israeli state with the ways in which American Jews um, practice Judaism in synagogues is what is at the heart of my discomfort here. I think that um, whoever, I mean we don't know who burned this flag, we don't know what their intentions were, but we all, I think, suspect that it is a condemnation of Israel's actions. And the fact that a synagogue flies the flag of a particular country that has particular policies that are quite oppressive and, in fact, murderous um, is a problem. So I don't think that it's a threat, per se, against Jews or the, the congregation or the synagogue or Judaism. I think it is um, a political statement against the actions and policies of a military state. So there, there's just an issue here in our necessarily assuming that it's a threat against uh, the Jewish community or the synagogue itself. Um, the most important point on this, as I said, was not um, assigning or, under, or, or even projecting um, intent um, and I think part and, and by the way to your point about we, we haven't this is un, somewhat unprecedented it's not actually I recall we I'm pretty sure we wrote a resolution when an American flag was burned on a, a, a person's an individual's property in this case whose son was fighting in Iraq at the time and is and the flag was burned by someone who was making a political statement one on his property and burned the flag now it is that act, and I and I think it, and it bears more weight when, in both these cases, these are institutions that actually represent a lot of people or have a certain feel for a lot of people. So consequently, there are more people who um, feel the impact and the threat of this. And it's to those issues. It's it's and to, uh, once again promoting um, promoting d political dif uh, differences and the discussion and even the protests. And I think protests, uh, to Councilor Carney and Councilor Adams' point, uh, is is appropriate, and and albeit very uncomfortable for a lot of people, obviously. And this is this one is a much more powerfully emotional issue than than many that we've experienced in the community. So I think in that respect, it's a it is appropriate for the council to once again reassert the fact that while we honor and respect the ability for um, profound disagreement and strong uh, advocacy, we do not condone what qualifies <coughs> under law and morally as an assault, regardless of the intent. An assault on an individual's property and an assault on <coughs> that they consider a value, uh, regardless of what the motivations are for that value. And, and I would hold that that would actually be true for flags that I find offensive. I do not enjoy the right to go up and light that flag on fire that, uh, of that person. I go out and buy my own, and that comes up with its own issues, but at the same time, I think that I think it's appropriate for us to, to express our uh, 
our hope and aspirations that we we have um, so we can agree to disagree or have disagreements, but at the same time, we, there is a limit to how those disagreements are expressed. And you wanted to respond. I, I just want to say again, you know, I started off by saying I, I do condemn acts of violence. I um, do condemn criminal acts. I believe that people need to be held accountable for destruction of others' property. So that is an absolute given. I just think that um, the implication of this resolution that we're addressing a human rights issue or, um, you know, possibly addressing a, a hate crime um, and stating something about a hate crime, I think that that's where we're taking it um, a few steps well, too far. I just have to say again, there is no mention. In fact, I intentionally deleted or didn't consider any language that constituted the prosecution of hate or, or, or the, uh, that a hate crime had been committed insofar as we don't know who. Except that we don't write resolutions for every act of vandalism that happens. And there is a very particular reason that we are writing we, a resolution uh, about this. That's true. That is true. Every act of vandalism does not go recognized, but this is actually generic language that speaks to that very thing. That every act of vandalism, point in fact, is, is a violent act. Councilor Adams. Also, it's just if you think about vandalism, you know, someone could, you know, throw a brick through a downtown store owner's window, and that, that's vandalism. But no, we wouldn't write a resolution about that. And and I think there's there's an obvious distinction here. And just to just to point out, to circle back, <clears throat> if that flag was burned in a public space and public property, it would be protected free speech. But if a person was caught for burning the flag at the synagogue, they would be trespassing, committing malicious destruction of property, and criminal civil rights violations as well at a minimum. So there's a, a serious difference between the two. Any other discussion on this? I actually am I'm very grateful for the conversation. I, this is what I, this is honestly the power of resolutions insofar that they have no way to law, but it's the discussion, the, the, the rather challenging discussions of difficult things that's why I think there I mean when we do pass resolutions and of course we as a council take a lot of grief for a variety of resolutions that we write and and pass I do think they have value I think they have significant value and I think that's illustrated by this discussion and debate and I think also we prove by example that this is there's this is a better way to have uh, disagreements at some level so thank you uh, anyone else uh, all those in favor of Could the Could you roll call, please? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, roll call, please, on the, on the second reading. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Abstain. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. <coughs> Councilor Adams. Yes. The resolution passes. And <coughs> um, no presentations. Right. Okay. No presentations. No licenses and petitions are before us. Um, and we do have the minutes. And I, I should note that uh, Pam has been wrestling with uh, trying to get the minutes to you, and she succeeded. And I don't. I want you to appreciate the level of achievement. <laughs> I just take for granted. There was a lot of work involved in getting the minutes to you, just so you know. And they are here, so I will accept a motion for uh, the approval of the minutes uh, that follow for uh, Ed Lou. Uh, and the minutes on public safety. Move to approve. Second. All three of them. All three. Second, second, second. Okay. <laughs> uh, any discussion on the approval of minutes? Do you have a? Well, just uh, I lost uh, internet on what are the oh, dates. Okay. What are the dates <laughs> of the minutes we're approving? The, I'm sorry. Uh, for Ed Lou, it was July 1st, 2014. Okay, thank you. For public safety, it was September 8, 2014. Thank you. I'm sorry. Sorry about the internet too. Four now it's fine. okay. No further discussion. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <sighs> Uh, next up, we have an appointment <coughs> for referral. This is the Human Rights Commission. Uh,
Carol Toll, uh, Toll Oppenheim of Three Montview Avenue. Uh, the term to start November 2014 and expire November 2017. And this is a new appointment, so. Move to refer to Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances. Second. Uh, discussion on the referral. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now we recess for finance. Uh, pass the gavel to. Uh, Thank you. Oh, so passed the and, and the finance notes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, by the way, the internet. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I got it. Um, and would you call the roll of finance, please? Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Here. So the two things we have on our agenda tonight. The first one uh, is with regards to Florence Fields, uh, and I'll read the order. And I see the mayor is poised to explain it to us the minute I finish reading the order. Um, upon the recommendation of the mayor, order that whereas the city has committed to the development of recreation facilities known as Florence Recreational Fields, and whereas the Florence Recreational Fields include five multipurpose fields, two baseball fields, a walking trail, parking lots, future playground, and recreation pavilion, which will contain restrooms, a concession stand, and maintenance equipment storage, and whereas the project almost doubles the amount of the city of Northampton's recreation land for field sports and whereas bids for the development of the restroom concession and maintenance pavilion were received and opened on October 6th and whereas funds are needed to complete the project order that $162,500 be appropriated from the capital stabilization fund for the purpose of constructing the restroom concession and maintenance pavilion at Florence Fields. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Okay, and I believe the mayor is poised. Yes, uh, I, I um, as it was noted in the um, in the order itself, the bids on this were just opened um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Monday, October sixth. Um, we had originally been projecting that the project would cost approximately four hundred thousand um, dollars. As you saw from the bid documents that we included in what we sent out to you, um, they came in higher than that. Um, and, uh, and so we need to come to you tonight for a transfer of additional funds for the project. Um, you know, there were some additions to this actual facility um, that came up from the original planning. One major piece of it was trying to also accommodate the new uh, DPW maintenance equipment. Uh, when we made the decision that it made more sense to buy dedicated equipment for the field, and then it even made more sense to actually store it on site, um, we wanted to build into this pavilion the capability to be able to store uh, the track, the dedicated mower and trimmers and all the other equipment um, so that that stuff wouldn't have to keep being transported back and forth. Um, there were also a number of sustainability measures that were added to the project. Um, the, uh, our recreation director, Anne Marie Mojo, is here to talk about it. And I thought it would be good to see a visual because I know people are, think are thinking to themselves, um, you know, this is a very expensive restroom or a very expensive concession stand, but it's actually quite a substantial and beautiful and actually green facility. So we've got some um, copies of this of the design that was actually bid. Um, <coughs> And let me have, uh, if I could ask you to recognize our recreation director, Emery Mogio. She can kind of walk you through uh, the building and she can talk about some of the process that where we got to uh, today. I do want to add, I did make a request, if possible, uh, that we could get a second reading on this project. Um, because we were trying to work on a fairly tight time frame over the winter to get this project constructed for spring, um, we have the bids were guaranteed for 14 days um, by the three by the contractors who bid on it. So um, these the price that we have in hand is a four, has a 14 day window on it. And so if we um, took the traditional route of taking one reading tonight and then waiting till November 6th, we would in fact go beyond the um, the bid guarantee date. So um, so that's the other reason for. Well, that's one of the reasons for wanting to do it. Of course, the other obvious reason is we want to get the contractor on site to begin doing, um, begin the construction this fall um, so that they can then work on it over the winter time, um, principally the slab and, and other utilities and site work that needs to happen in for the actual construction. So if you would recognize uh, uh, Ms. Mogio, that Move would Move to recognize Ms. Mogio. Second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Good evening. Thank you. Um, so as you um, see the, the picture of the facility and the mayor explained a lot of the process that we went through, how we got here with needing a little bit extra money to go into this amazing project that you've heard a lot about over the years that is coming to fruition. We're ready to open the fields next spring, hopefully, and we need obviously need a building with restrooms in it. Um, it's not just restrooms, it's restrooms in there. There's a men's, there's a woman's, and a family restroom. There is the storage area for not only um, the large mower that will be there and the DPW equipment, but also for sports equipment that needs to be in there. All the different leagues have different sections to put all their bases and, and balls and, and um, all those kinds of things that they need out on the soccer and baseball fields. Also, there is a concession area that will be great for the leagues to sell different um, amenities at and different things at throughout for tournaments and throughout the season. And there's nice sitting areas with a roof over it and picnic tables and things for people to enjoy out of the sun in the hot summer. So there is a lot entailed with it. When we started with the building, we didn't just want a cookie cutter type. A lot of our fields right now have these concrete, just square concrete bathroom buildings. And this is obviously such a special place that when we went to planning, when we went to plan for it, we really wanted to make it a special building. So and we want it to fit in aesthetically down there. We wanted it to really welcome people and be something that we can be really proud of. So, and, and also with zero energy, we have, uh, there will be um, on the roof, there will be solar panels going up. The city is working on that now. So those will be, we've, the building is designed to be able to hold those once we get to that point, hopefully within the next year of having those installed. We're working with uh, Chris Mason, the city energy officer, and with other projects in the city that he's working on to put those there. Um, so I don't know if you have any. You also have a picture of the layout of the, the inside of the building. There's also a meeting room, too, behind the concession area. There's a little meeting room area for teams and officials and different things, because with so many different fields here, we really expect it to be a really a, a well-used facility. Questions? Um, so, in that this is zero energy, I'm, I'm assuming there's nothing that's really heated in here. There's, right. There's, so, it, you, your facilities are essentially water, and uh, that's it, right? I mean, the water in the bathrooms, you'll have to have a hot water for the heater. Electricity. Electricity for electricity. There is, for there is some HVAC with the, the bathroom. Um, right, venting system. Venting and, and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and the concession area uh, is, is there equipment for cooking and, uh, or preparing food? That's not included in, in this yet, no. But it will be fundraised for. So at some point it, it would need to have a vent for uh, exhaust for? Oh, we're not going to go. It's not, it's not going to be built to be that intense, I guess you want to say, inside with, with a cooking facility and things. What, we, what usually is sometimes you have the hot dog machines or different kinds of right things to make uh, a lot of times people will have grills outside you, at different when you go to different towns for different things sometimes those will be outside um there'll be refrigerator re re yeah there's refrigeration uh popcorn you know different kinds of snacks we really hope we talked we did a tour last week of the gardens and we talked briefly but we really hope to partner with the different um, groups around the around the fields the crimson and clover farm and the and the organic gardens and things to try to offer you know, the healthy we'll or kale healthy chips, foods. Actually. Kale yeah. chips, those are really good. <laughs> I'm still not gonna get the kale chips, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the, um, when you say the various clubs can use the concession stands, um, at this risk of sounding horribly crass, do we get a taste of that? And I mean, like, do we get any of that money? Oh yeah, we, have, we'll, we will be working on some kind of plan with that. It's the only place we don't really have any concessions anywhere else, but the way it works at other towns, which we've started to look into, is you know they rent it or they you know per usage whatever whoever's using it they we get something so that it can help. Usually we, we obviously want it to help maintain and clean and right. in, in that sense. It's very stuff. similar to so. what the what the high school sports team does. Right. Yeah. Most of the concession booth at the football games and soccer games are run by parents mm -hmm. and yeah. booster clubs. And the profits are for the boost for the teams to support the team. So I assume, yeah. you know, Little League and and uh, Cal Ripken and other people who use it will be. You'll have Cal Ripken parents or Little League parents mm -hmm. selling 
popcorn and hot dogs to raise money for uniforms and for other stuff. Yeah. Cold yeah. storage of uh, the equipment is adequate for. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll figure. Yeah, make that all work. It it will be. I mean, usually it's not like a huge huge operation. And who you know we we've <coughs> gone to the point of is it something in the future that becomes used so much that we you know run we have someone operating it and working you know working there every night and offering the kale chips to all the leagues you know so but we will um you know make sure that it's sustainable and a lot of times people will use some like we have a popcorn machine people will rent you know for a, a minimal amount but they'll use that for different events and things so it helps to keep the like you know get the money and then you can buy a new one when it's needed because you've okay. and then just one last question about liability for people using things like that mm -hmm. and uh, um, I'm assuming or do we require any bonding on their part, or are we we covered under the city's? That's a good insurance? question. I'm not. I'm not. At we are. I mean, that we're point. covered under. We, I, I don't know that we, we do require groups to get bonds and things when they rent facilities or when they rent parks or things. I don't think they we do it insurance. for popcorn machines. Probably not. Um, well, we, we have umbrella. Well, we do have liability insurance and umbrella insurance. So, I think they would be covered under that if we were to lend them or rent them the machine. So I, I feel a little more comfortable knowing that that that, that we're that we're sure of that because right yeah. I think that, mm -hmm. that there's opportunities here for mm -hmm. this to be shut down because we can't afford to the, the liability aspect. Mm -hmm. of it. Thank you. Sure. Any uh, more, uh, Councilor Barge? Yes. Um, when apparently the first price came out, the storage area was not included, so. Now, because you're coming back, the decision of putting in that storage area has brought forth the price, correct? Well, when we first started planning and made our budget for the whole entire right. facility, we didn't have that as a part of, of the picture. So, okay. right. right. And it's has since become part of it and makes sense. And we, we added it and it made the building get a little bit bigger. I agree with that. <laughs> Thank you, Anne Marie. Mm -hmm. And Bill answered quite a bit of things. I had concerns about the liability also. Yes, he is raising his hand. Um, probably a question for the mayor. Um, it, it states that it was determined that it was more cost effective to store the field maintenance instead of hauling. Could you just speak to that analysis? Well, we just, we, um, uh, you know, this is a significant increase. What does it represent? It's like a is it like a 40% increase in our number in our fields in our, in our recreational in our recreational fields. fields and so when we were building the budget for this past year we were we had to sit down with DPW and and, and the rec department and determine that we would have to um, actually hire another staff position to be able to take to, to be dedicated to that and that we would need to have an additional mower as well that would pretty much be primarily working on this field um, throughout the throughout the season when you're cutting the lawn. Um, and so when we thought about that we would have to put it on a trailer and move it up there all the time randomly throughout the week, it just made sense that we knew we needed the extra tractor and, and it just made sense to store it on site since it was primarily going to be used for this, you know, how many acre facility? 24. 24 acre facility. Um, and so, you know, we were going to buy the extra equipment. We've had to buy aerators and additional, um, actually some additional equipment to support the organic uh, treatments that we're going to be using on the fields as well. So it just made sense to have that all stored in place. Um, so that was the, that was kind of the analysis. Councilor Pine. Um, um, you mentioned that some of the fees would be recouped from um, rental of the concession. I'm just wondering how that will work. Is that money that will go directly back into a budget, a line item that um, serves the fields or the recreation department overall? What Generally what we do if it's if it's something at a particular site that, that the income that comes in, like we have pavilions that we rent out, so Mainsfield Pavilion. It stays in the revolving fund called Mainsfield Pavilion, and it's used to do maintenance or buy things for Mainsfield. So it would be, I would assume, it would be something similar to that. It's, it makes sense. Any further questions at this point? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, 
I, I just wanted to ask, you know, if, if this were not done, I mean, I mean, we wouldn't expect any better bids at any point, it wouldn't seem. Um, the next lowest bid on the first chart is $60,000 greater than the lowest one. And the difference between the lowest one and the largest bid is like two hundred thousand dollars. So um, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense in your mind to put this back out to bid. And I think one of our issues is we're you know, there's a somewhat of a tight window because we we want to open the fields in the spring. We'd like to, and so that was one of the stipulations in the in the in the contract mm -hmm. the RFP that we put out. The bid specs. What was your deadline? You, there was a certain. Yeah, they're they're supposed to start it this fall and finish it by the spring. I want to say May. I'm not sure though. Yeah. But yeah, so that it would be ready for the spring leagues. Okay. To start. And so I think the, I would suspect that the the less time you give somebody to do that, there's going to be more of a cost premium, right. particularly as the, as the risk of the freeze and snow and everything else comes into play. Okay. So that yeah. Well, thank you. And as a, a, a follow-up, I mean, there's lots of state money here, as, as you point out, which is exactly. I think which we, is we, great. We, and we've pointed out that this represents like three percent of the overall project right. coming from general fund dollars. The rest of it is made up of state mm -hmm. park grants, CPA funds, and then there'll be a lot of fundraising okay. in the community to, to support other aspects of the project. And so my question on that point is, you know, do we jeopardize that state money? Um, with time and by by waiting, is that kind of the reason why you have a, a tight timeline for this? Or we already <coughs> received four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, the maximum oh, state so it's grant in, it's in the project. So I don't believe we'll. I, it'd be doubtful we'd receive any more because that's the maximum allowed per project. So I don't. Oops. Yeah. No so I w yeah I, w I wasn't clear. I, I guess I didn't understand that we had the money in hand. I thought. By waiting, we may actually jeopardize the money yeah. from the state. Yeah, no, we've no. spent. The Not that we get more, yeah. but the park grant actually went into the actual construction, yeah. the field construction okay. part of the project. Um, this was more of an, uh, an ancillary piece of it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Further questions? Seeing none, then ready to vote in finance. All in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you. And um, do you require Ms. Mogio to stay for the full council meeting? She, she, no, I, she can't can see why. Uh, thank you. You can go home to the Patriots game. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Edward. Thank you. And the only other um, finance financial order we have tonight is upon the recommendation of the mayor. Order that $15,000 be appropriated from the parking receipts reserved for appropriation to the collector's financial management services account for the purpose of paying merchant service fees associated with credit card use at the E.J. Gare parking garage. Do I have a motion on this one? Make a motion. We got a motion and a second. And here's the yes. matter to explain this one. So you um, are all aware that we just installed a brand new uh, uh, entry system in the garage. And one of the features of that new system is that it does, um, it, it has the capability, it's not turned on yet, to accept credit cards. Um, and so what we had to do is actually go through a, a, a state procurement process um, because actually the whole process of collecting the associated bank fees from all the various banks like, like retailers have to do, like any, anybody that uses credit cards have to do, we actually had to hire a third party financial services company to actually do that for us. And then um, as a result of that, we need to now create a new account line item in our parking budget that didn't exist before um, for these, uh, I guess we're calling it the F financial management services account. And so we're, we're asking to take money from the receipts reserved for parking account to populate that, uh, this account with $15,000 uh, to be used to, to then pay these fees uh, going forward. Um, we did do a lot of research. Uh, we got we we um, we got quotes from the various vendors and talked to many of our surrounding communities. Um, we did end up um, going um, with the state bid. Um, the state already had a services company that had already had a bid, and none of the other vendors we talked to could match the state bid. Um, so uh, so that's what we need to do here, and I have the, the finance director can explain any of the, the mechanics of it, but basically 
think when you go into a store to buy something um, and you use a credit card, there is an associated fee that gets charged off to whatever the bank is, or um, and that all has to be done. And this company does that and makes sure that all those different payments go to all the appropriate, you know, whatever it may be, Wells Fargo or whoever, you know, MNBA or whatever your credit card company is. Um, so that is one of the issues of about. Um, doing credit cards, there is a cost to doing business uh, by offering this. So it is something that we are going to be monitoring. Um, and I will also say that you may recall, um, as part of the capital plan, uh, we had also had a project that looked at retrofitting all of our street kiosks with credit cards. We want to implement this first because we want to get a, a, a really good read on, um, on what those fees will represent. I know some of our um, neighboring communities, Amherst namely, um, they can be significant, particularly, I say significant, significant relative to the kinds of parking fees that we charge in Northampton. Um, if you park in a parking garage in the city of Boston and you pay, you know, whatever you pay, $64 or something to park for the day, the fee as a percentage of that may not seem very high, but, it, you know, we have much lower rates, so I think that so we want to. So this is part of a, a learning curve for us moving to this. But we really do believe that it, in the long run, it makes our parking system more attractive, more accessible, easier for people uh, to figure out. Um, and uh, and we just think it'll be it'll 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 build upon what we're what we're doing to make it more customer service friendly. So, finance directors here, if you have uh, specific questions as well. Um, actually, the mayor answered my answered. preemptive question about the That's street yes. yeah yeah we're kind of holding we're kind of holding off until we get this system up and running and we're going to try to um, you know just try to get an understanding of what that's going to be um, so we've put this money in this account for now and now we're going to um, see how it plays out for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the year yeah can we get some information about what the percentage is? I mean, is it industry standard? I think like your credit card statement where you open it up and there's like this long, um, I mean, there's a whole, you go ahead, you can, you can run through how it works. There's it's basically, when you swipe a credit card, there's actually three fees that are occurring. The first fee is the interchange fee. So I'm going to use the example, if you have a TD Bank uh, Visa debit card. TD Bank is going to get that interchange fee because they're giving, you're using their card. Then there's the assessment from the credit card company. So then there's a, so there's a payment to, say, TD Bank. Then there's a payment to Visa. And then the third payment is the processing fee. And that's what we're actually contracting for. So then the processor who's going to make all of these exchanges happen gets a piece of the fee. So the, actually, every swipe, there's three fees going on. Now, the fees for the cards, to, the bank cards, the banks set that fee. It's not something you can negotiate. That's just set for every type of card that you have. The Visa or MasterCard or Discover is also a set fee, so you don't have a choice on that. And that's usually some percentage. Um, the processing fee is what we're actually um, we're able to do, as the mayor said, we looked at other vendors, we ended up going with the state bid. So that's the only piece that we actually can control in this whole scenario of going to credit card fees. So for, um, for the processing fee, it's going to be about eight cents per transaction. And what percentage does that represent of the, the parking fee? Well, th there's flat fees and there's percentage fees. For the processing fee, which is what we're going on the state bid, it's a flat $0.08. There's no percentage. But then Visa takes a piece and it varies. There's a 40-page document which tells all of the fees, and it varies depending on which bank it is, whether it's a Visa, whether it's a MasterCard, whether it's a Discover. Um, it's literally 40 pages so it all depends on what bank the person swiping is using <coughs> and what um, type of credit card they're using so well that complicates things so so if somebody pays for one hour it's eight cents on that one hour then on a 50 cent and in fact actually what does this do with the first hour free program that we have as well because if they're doing a transaction they're only staying for an hour 
they but still the have to first hour the free we will not be paying any fees on so okay. if they if they they're there 55 minutes but they don't remember and they swipe and they get no charge we're not going to pay okay. for that so. right. that was a concern and, right. and then so I, I I can see how this could become somewhat onerous if you're if you're having for instance for one hour parking downtown you're you're paying 50 cents we're paying eight cents out of each one of those 50 cents so we're this is a significant discount on our, our, our revenues in some respect. And um, th there's also the debit model, of course, where somebody has to punch in their debit ID <coughs> the bank, which actually is a lower cost usually in transaction fees at point of sale. Actually, the debit cards cost more. The charge for a debit card transaction is, is much more. So we will only be enabling credit card transactions at the at the parking garage. That's, it's more because of the processor charges <coughs> or the equipment it's, cost? It's the more. times when you swipe your debit card, like a credit card. Right. Because it doesn't actually have, this doesn't have. Right. Like it doesn't, it prompt, yeah. This, it's not a pin. So it's the times when you use your, pin. like my co-op bank. Right. You know, ATM card also could act. Card if you want. I understand that it's, it's just that for instance on POS systems point of sale systems in retail it's actually cheaper for when when I worked in retail once upon a time it was actually cheaper to do debit the service charges were cheaper when you did a debit because it's more or less a straight transaction with the bank and it's not so much you're not dealing with Visa you're not dealing with anyone else so consequently it costs less so we always encourage people to yeah. use their debit card instead of a credit card which took a much bigger bite we were close to 14 percent in those transactions and all of the models that we were shown from the various vendors the debit card with the pin pad now a person who only wants to use their debit card if they have a visa or mastercard on that debit card they're just going to swipe it and <coughs> just right. act like a credit card right. so we're not putting a pin pad on the machines because of the additional cost of that it's it's yeah, it's, um, and, and then of course we're in flux. So there are actually now new payment systems that are actually in the offing, and then probably in, in two years' time we may actually be looking at an obsolete system that may, uh, with smartphone payments and some systems like that, uh, just got back from Canada. They have embedded chips in every card, so you don't have to do anything other than wave your credit card and bada boom. Um, so, it, and is there a, an ability for this system to be retrofitted in order to accommodate some of these changes? You know. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a company that that's sort of on the cutting edge. They do major, you know, they I mean, they may do parking facilities in Canada, but I mean, they do. <laughs> well, we've, we've had our experience with Canadian yeah. operating systems. Before. True, we don't. That's probably a bad example. <laughs> yeah. uh, an American company doing business in Canada. Right? <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, so I think that they'll they'll have to adapt. But I mean, again, we're also talking about you know, um, we have to also go through the whole procurement process and government will have to catch up to that those standards as well um, so uh, but I you know I, I think I think we're fairly confident that this system will will they have modules that they can switch things out it's sort of have plug-and-play so if we did move to some new system like that I'm you know we would need to pursue a retrofit um, um, I'm wondering if I mean this is clearly ultimately taxpayer money that is going to defray these costs but I'm wondering if this if we're thinking kind of long term does this um, mean that within a certain period of time we're going to be raising the fees for the for the use of the garage in order to cover this additional cost I don't know that we would I, 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 we're not obviously we're not making proposing any changes as part of this I will say that um, you know that the city independent of this has has um, contracted with a um, with a firm a consulting firm that's going to be doing a, 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 a parking study sort of a, a major big parking study of the city um, we actually uh, did a whole RFP and screening process uh, your colleague um, who's the chair of the transportation and parking commission was on the screening committee the someone from the parking subcommittee, et cetera, and we've selected a, um, a company, um, and they're going to be doing a series of public meetings. They're going to be looking at all of, our, um, all of our facilities, looking at our pricing models, our pricing systems, um, looking at our inventory, our capacity, looking at what we need to add in the future, um, looking at issues like the roundhouse lot that we've been discussing and, and what the development potential is versus the parking needs. So. Um, we're hoping that's going to give us some information about that, but um, but we're not uh, we're not proposing any immediate changes. Um, so, uh, but again, I think this is um, 
you know, I view it as a, uh, it's a, it's a cost of doing business and providing this particular service, this credit card service for people, which has, you know, become so ubiquitous for, for most people, whether it's buying a movie ticket or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we frequently have people who don't have change or don't have, you know, the correct money. And, uh, and so, and they go to other cities, you know, right around us where they can just swipe a card. You know, Amherst, Greenfield, Springfield, um, they, they all have that capacity. Um, so, but it is a, you know, I was having a Facebook conversation with some people the other day about some of our other online fees. Um, that's a conversation we have to look at as well, because now when we, when people want to, um, you know, pay their property tax uh, using a credit card, there's a fee, and again, it's the same process. We have to go out to bid, we have to hire a company, and that's a processing charge. Currently, we pass that on to the customers. Um, it's actually 25 cents if you use their, de you know, debit your checking account, so it's fairly reasonable. Um, but that's one of those issues that, uh, that you know, we struggle with is is that something we absorb or is that something we should pass on to customers and and you know they've got the whole revenue issue and, and all those kinds of things so you know as we move more and more towards electronic payments these are the kinds of issues we're going to have to grapple with I know nonprofits grapple with it you know small nonprofits that want to start accepting credit cards you know through PayPal you know if somebody gives us a hundred dollar donation do we deduct it in their donations you know ninety seven dollars and twenty five cents or do we make it a hundred dollar deduction and we pay the fee so it's, it's those are the kinds of issues we're we're grappling with so we're starting with this system we're going to implement it we're, we have the ability using this new system to actually be able to look at the types of charges the size of charges what are our most frequent charges and that will really and then how many people actually use credit cards that's the other piece we don't we can't really predict right now how many of our transactions will be credit cards because we don't have a credit card capability right now so that'll be a that'll be an interesting over the next six to eight months we'll be able to look back and uh, and I can report to you how that's going. Any further questions on this one? Findings? Seeing none. Uh, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And being that's all we have. For could I just add, could I ask one question for you? Um, the only the only question on this I didn't request two readings um, on this originally when we submitted it. Um, essentially, all we're asking you to do is to take fifteen thousand from the receipts reserved for parking and just move it into this account um, within the parking fund. Um, the only reason I, I throw it out to you is that um, when we get this approved, we can turn on the credit card. So. Um, if you were to approve it tonight, we can contact the vendor and we can turn on the credit cards this weekend. Um, otherwise, we wait until your second reading on November 6th, and then we can turn it on. So, um, but in terms of the actual, we're not asking you to appropriate new money. It's This is money we already have collected. It's in the receipt reserve for parking. It's already within the parking budget. We're asking you to move it over into this other fund to, to cover these fees. So um, we're not, it, it, I just throw that out to you if I, it would be, it would be appreciated if we could turn it on sooner, but I don't want to press my luck by asking for too many two reading votes. We won't have it by this weekend, no okay, well, she's saying it wouldn't turn on by this weekend. <laughs> Not by anyway. this weekend, Not anyway. This weekend. We still have contracts to sign, and and one of the reasons we're doing this is one way you can do it is you can just take the fees out of the revenue, but that's um, that's how we originally envisioned this. But in talking to other communities, that's not really advisable because you really want your revenue stream to reflect the actual revenue and then your cost of doing business in another place. So, you know, originally we thought we it would all roll in and it's not the best way to do it. So that's why we're coming retrospective, you know, after the budget to kind of put this in as a line item. Mm -hmm. And so I withdraw the, it'll turn on this week, <laughs> but it will turn on sooner. 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 Than, you know, add how, how many days do you think? <coughs> sign the contract. I think it, it, it'll probably take two weeks to get the contracts in place and we have the contract with the processing vendor and then David Pomerantz needs to work with the parking vendor to basically turn on the credit card component. You know the goal I think was to try to get it in place so that by bag day when things start to get really really busy downtown we'll have them, we'll have them in place but if we wait till November 6th that probably wouldn't happen. 
And is this the only other item you guys are here for tonight? If we uh, don't, do we need them to stay for the regular meeting? There's uh, two, there's second readings on a couple of other items in finance. So yeah. then, uh, since that's our only two items, uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All right. Aye. Okay. Thank you. So we um, <clears throat> come out of recess and go back to the council meeting and revisit those financial orders. Um, and the first up, of course, is the financial order relative to the Florence Recreational Fields uh, uh, Pavilion and the allocation of $162,500 towards that. Move first reading. Second. Second. Any further discussion on this item? Um, roll call, please. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Suspend Rule 14. Second. Motions are made and seconded to suspend Rule 14, which asks for a second reading. So it calls for a second reading in this meeting. Uh, any discussion on the suspension of rules? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Move second reading. Second it. Second reading moved. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Next up is the financial order of uh, $15,000 appropriated for merchant service fees associated with credit card use at the J. Gar Gar uh, parking garage or what did you call it? You call it <laughs> garage geese. Garage geese. Uh, Pam, Pam coined a term, garage geese. But uh, um, yeah, I'll approve. accept a motion put it on the floor. Move to approve. Second. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Suspend Rule 14. Second. Motions are made and seconded to suspend rules to allow for a second reading this evening. Is there any discussion on the suspension of rules? Councilor O'Donnell. Um, did, but did I understand that we'd have to wait? We would wait two weeks anyway for the contracts to be in place, or is that two weeks from the day we put uh, the money? We can't sign a contract without an authorization. Okay. So until the sec until you guys take your final vote, okay. then the clock starts. So to if it's ticking. approved on the on the next meeting, the sixth, it would, it would be two weeks from that point, and we'll be well into um, our deepest parking season. Any further discussion on the suspension of rules? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'll accept a motion for the second reading. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Next up, we have second reading on um, the couple of other financial orders. The first one is the lease for handicapped accessible entrance to Mar Thorns Market. I'll accept a motion. Put that on the floor. Move to approve. Second. Any f any further discussion on this, Councilor? Just a quick question. Uh, just a quick question about about the um, the thousand dollars the cost of the lease. Does that go to any particular place? It's a good question. I believe it would just come in as a general revenue. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that, it's not dedicated to any particular fund. So, yeah. Yeah. Just verify that that's correct. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor 
White. Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Adonis? Oh, never mind. You want to vote again? <laughs> Right. <laughs> that my vote counts double. Anyway, <laughs> no, just half okay. each time. So that, um, <laughs> so that passes in second reading. Uh, next up is the financial order to acquire land from the Cowan family. McCown, right? Move to approve. Um, uh, there's a motion. To, is there a second? Second. That's okay. That was good. Any any further discussion? Roll call on this, please. Councilor Shera? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Uh, passes in second reading. And the last financial order is to rescind borrowing for the boathouse project and Lamprum Playground, uh, Park Playground and Bridge Trails at Beaverbrook. Move to approve. Okay. Motion's made and seconded. Any further discussion on this item? Roll call, please. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? <coughs> yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Scherer? Yes. That also passes in second reading. And now, um, now we go up to the big chunk of, of uh, the our council agenda, and you probably all recall that uh, after we had one hearing, which was required. Uh, the council felt it was necessary to have a second hearing on the mayor's administrative orders for city government. And uh, as such, this item is removed from the agenda because we have not completed the hearings on this. And so I would like to take this time that's been granted to us or that we bestowed on ourselves, probably more appropriately, and try and figure out um, good times. We need to. We need. We'll need to do a, a week announcement, an announcement, uh, a public announcement, or a week in advance. My preference would be to do it at the JFK uh, community room, if possible, to bring it to another portion of town. Um, we have a less than a 60-day window in which to affect this, but that we certainly have plenty of time before the next council meeting. Council Act. I'd like to suggest. Um, the, week, the week after next week that begins Monday the 27th because that's prior to the next council meeting but it also gives enough notice so if possible perhaps sometimes that week I, maybe we can do a different time too I'll be out of town Wednesday Thursday and Friday of that week oh, Monday or Tuesday Tuesday is the, School the meeting. Finance meeting we have finance, finance meeting that Council Murphy announced but if we could I mean I, I don't mind doing it it's yeah I think we should do it so if we could do it at 7 that, that night, perhaps, as long as we're done here. Are you suggesting seven. Tuesday the 28th? That's what I'm suggesting. Okay. Did you no. Thursday. Thursday and plus, that's the bonus week of the, it's the bonus week nobody theoretically has meetings for the most part that would come in conflict with this. Um, well, Pam, so I'm not going to do an official announcement on this yet, although well, I have to announce a public meeting. Thursday that we could uh, well, I just won't be there. So it could be there on Tuesday. Could be there Tuesdays. Is there, does anyone have a problem with Tuesday? Um, no, no. And and uh, as per Councilor Adams' request, the hope is to or to convene at seven this time. I mean, that would be my recommendation, right. just in case there are people have different work schedules. Right. Last one was at five. Maybe that would be at JFK. Yes, I think so. It's um, um, JFK. And we have finance there. Then meets, oh, meets to five. How are you? Yeah, finance will be at five. Five o'clock? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you enough time to abide by the speed limit and get up to the uh, JFK? I'll, I'll, I'll get advice from the mayor on that. Or we, well, that's Councillor Klein suggested maybe do the meeting at JFK. Yep. Oh, well, there, there you go. You could actually convene the mm -hmm. finance meeting at uh, JFK? I think we'd rather have that here. Okay. And for okay. staff. But it's Text not going to go two hours, I don't think. Um, all right. Um, so if we say Tuesday, 7 o'clock, 7 to 9, at the JFK community room now, I'm committing us to a room that we haven't determined is actually available to us. Um, it, but um, I want to conform to the rules of uh, com calling, announcing public hearings. So I'm going to take a leap of faith. <laughs> let, me let me suggest, since that is an evening that it seems like everyone could come, that I would think the 
<clears throat> presence of more counselors is more important than the room, even though I would agree, I, hopefully it could be at JFK. Well, we, we don't, that's, that is the, uh, to the school committee and the school committee's property people, and that's, we don't. No, what I'm saying, but if we can't get that room, we at least have that evening where everybody right. could come. Right. Well, we could come and I, I would yeah. agree with you, it would be better to do it at JFK, but I would Your say, Your Honor, you have a suggestion? I, my, my only suggestion would be that there's also the, I mean, you could say it's at JFK Middle School. Um, got we've got the cafetorium, we've got right. the library. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have access to the schedule online to tell you okay. if there's some other meeting, but um, there are there's other meeting rooms you could use at JFK if the community that's important available. and then we can put so. signage up there so I will announce uh, the public hearing will convene at JFK Middle School at 7 o'clock uh, on Tuesday October 28th this is a f another hearing that will convene to discuss the mayor's omnibus administrative orders and uh, invite the public to come and contribute ask questions and discuss these issues the uh, we had we already had a, a rather long and and, and uh, thoughtful discussion about uh, shade tree commission and also the Department of Public Works and the Board of Public Works but hopefully we'll have an opportunity to hear some from some board members uh, there are some other issues that people may you can find these administrative orders online if you want to see um, what the scope of change is and if you agree disagree or or have questions about any of those please come and attend the meeting um, the, and you're welcome to speak and there is no time limit to your speaking although we would ask you to be considerate of others who have would like to speak as well so that meeting once again seven o'clock JFK Middle School uh, Tuesday the 28th and as I said <laughs> That just knocked out about half of the agenda. And so we are left with, um, as I scroll down, I think nothing else. Yes, unless oh, no. oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I take it back. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What am I saying? I just got optimistic <laughs> there for a second. We have seven more. Okay. Seven more. Yep, 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 yep. Um, all right. <laughs> this is uh, this is second reading for bike lanes. Is the positive recommendation from no uh, election? I'm sorry. You're missing one. Oh, the one for state election. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. And we'll try to delete. Thank you, Councilor. You're welcome. Um, the warrant for the November 4th, 2014 state election. This is the second reading. It's kind of important that we Move get to approve. This. There's a motion. Second. To second. Any further discussion on that? Um, yeah. Please be, as, as uh, Citizen Smolensky pointed out, there is an election. Please vote, regardless of who or what you vote for. Um, so, no further discussion on this. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shera? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Okay, so we do not. Uh, we skip the next two mm -hmm. and go to bike lanes, which is the second reading. And this is, uh, as I saying, was a positive recommendation from uh, ordinance. A second reading. I'll accept a motion. Put it on the floor. Um, move approval. Second. Um, you all recall this is to actually establish bike lanes that already exist, uh, or to <laughs> authorize and allow bike lanes <laughs> that already exist. Um, any further discussion on this? Roll call, please. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shera? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Uh, passes in second. Next up is the parking prohibition all times on Main Street in Florence. Um, perhaps Councilor O'Donnell wants to speak to some of the uh, confusion that was generated by this this is but this also comes with a positive recommendation from ordinance sure. and second reading council O'Donnell. And, and in fact i move we take this and the, the next one as in, in the next one would be the schedule three limited time parking on main street in florence also with a positive recommendation from ordinance i'll accept them so it's made the motion's made to put it on the floor is there a second second okay and council O'Donnell, do you want to speak to, I, I know that there was some confusion generated by a Radio report and some oh, citizens yes. who thought yeah. that we were going to abolish parking in downtown Florence. That's that's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, although some have called for it, I, I, <laughs> I, I, 
Um, this council will preserve parking in downtown Florence. Um, this is an, an ordinance simply to clear. It's, it's a really a technical um, correction um, that pertains to the block in front of Cooper's Corner in, in Florence, where there is a sign that says you are permitted to park there for an hour. Um, however, in, in the Code of Ordinances, it was, it was actually prohibited to park there. So that's an error, and we're simply making the code conform to the reality. And these two ordinances establish one-hour parking on this block. Point, in fact, to our expanding parking that, that was previously in the books as prohibited. Absolutely. <laughs> that's very welcome, I'm sure. Um, thank you for that clarification. Any other discussion on these two items? Uh, roll call on the two, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Speckman. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. That passes in second reading, and congratulations to all the folks in Florence who are not violating the law anymore. So, uh, next up is the detached accessory apartments. Uh, positive recommendation from uh, the Committee on Rules, Orders, and Appointments and Ordinances. This is also on the second reading. I'll accept a motion. Thank you, Perp. Second. Uh, any further discussion on this item? Roll call, please. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Next up is second reading for the site land lighting standards, uh, with the, also with a positive recommendation from uh, uh, ordinance. Uh, accept the motion put on the floor first. Is there? Second. I thought you were. Motion is motion made and seconded for purposes of discussion. And I wanted to propose we postpone this one. Uh, if you recall, um, when it came up the last time, we asked for comments from the police department. And I don't know. I, I think the comment got distributed to the members of the ordinance committee by email today. But I'll, I'll read it because I don't think it went to everybody. But remember, we wanted the police department to comment on it. And the chief's comment was, and this was to Carolyn, I don't know how much depth you want me to provide and comment here, but lighting is universally acknowledged as being the second most effective crime prevention reduction strategy right behind uh, increased police patrols. Lighting has five primary crime prevention values, deterrence, detection, surveillance, and fear reduction, and liability reduction. These will all be negatively impacted by abolishing outdoor uh, freestanding lighting in commercial business districts. I also believe the proposal to use motion detectors is not effective as an alternative, as they can easily be thwarted and would be getting calls for false positives due to wind, animals, or whatever and the prolific use of video monitoring will be rendered useless, further negatively impacting deterrence and detection factors. Therefore, I can't support the, uh, the change. I do want to point out that I'm very much aware of light pollution and energy saving issues and fully support the value of well-designed downward lighting. And I might point out that our zoning already includes a requirement that the lights be downward and don't broadcast off the property. Uh, Carolyn provided another comment, and the reason I want to postpone is because I want her to be here because I want to question her about this. Chief's response relative to lighting, uh, uh, to shutting lights off after closing as being part of the ordinance, uh, let's see, because she forwarded it. My recommendation to the planning board, if this doesn't pass, will be to continue to add this as a condition to permits and uh, she feels this has worked very well at places like Home Morgan for after hours. So, you know, I would be concerned if we don't add it to the zoning, but planning is going to stick it in their permits anyway. I mean, I just want her to be able to be here for us to question her. So I don't want to vote on it until someone from planning actually comes back so we can address both the police concerns about the negative impact of limiting the lighting and also have her explain why if in fact we don't go along with it, that they go sticking it in permit requirements anyway. So for all of those reasons, I'd like us to put it off until they can come back. Councilor Adams. Um, uh, if, if she adds new information or perspectives, the chief may have a rebuttal to that as well. Could we, could we maybe ask the chief to be present as well? Um, I mean, we, we, cer we certainly could, but 
clearly it'd be nice to have the planners back to well, address certainly. why in light of police pretty much saying they don't support this that they would still encourage it i agree and, and she's not here to answer those questions so and we'll postpone till, uh, the next council meeting and afford carolyn a chance to Is there a request to have someone, a representative from the police department, come speak to this as well? Um, if we need to, but I think we're, the letter, the memo from the chief speaks for itself. It seems to be pretty clear that they don't understand. But if we're trying to uh, figure something out, and if Carolyn Mish is making an alternate pro proposal, then I then would yes. be interested. Then in yes, well, we certainly could ask. Yep. I think that so if you could include uh, a request to the uh, uh, Carolyn Mitch and to the chief or some representative of the chief uh, to come speak to this issue of the next council meeting, that would be great. Councilor Donald, do you have a question? Oh, just briefly, I mean, it seems like we should be able to amend this with, with input in, in a way that would make it work and provide perhaps exclusions for certain unsafe situations and that kind of thing. So, and Councilor Carney has a motion on the floor actually to table the next council meeting right mm -hmm. uh, so it's heard, and there's a second any discussion on the table all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. Any opposed okay thank you and <coughs> thank you for that information i just forwarded you all the chief's memo so which i meant to do before i started the meeting tonight that's my bad could these next two be taken as a group i'll move these next two as a group then Second. The next, the next two, are the motions made and seconded to move uh, on-street parking meter zones um, and violations and penalties to amend. No, the, uh, actually, the limited time parking. I'm sorry, limited time parking. <laughs> yes, limited time par that makes more sense. Limited time parking and then the uh, schedule uh, eight <laughs> on on-street parking meter zones, mm -hmm. uh, both in second reading. Uh, and there's a motion made and seconded. Is there second. any discussion? I already got a second. Did, oh, you got. Uh, hmm? Sorry, looking for a second. Yeah, you were a second. <laughs> gotcha. He did second. I, yeah. I second the approval. Yeah, he did. He second that. On that. See, and got credit it. for it. So gold star for you. Nice. <laughs> it's all going on your permanent record. Uh, <laughs> there is no permanent. record. <laughs> yeah. Any further discussion on these yes. items, Councilor Adams? Looking at the 15 minute spots. Um, in, in rereading this again, I noticed that the 15-minute spots will, as it states, apply to all hours. The way it currently works is that after 6 p.m., okay. they're regular spots. That's that's at least how that, that's how it works. This would change that so they'd be 15-minute spots all night, where um, a person could, you know, theoretically get a ticket after that point. They've only parked there for 15 minutes. I I um I, I think we should either change that so that um, the 15-minute rule only applies from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. when they're generally not ticketed. So I'll make the motion to strike all the hours where it states all in, in every category under every every section to um, to being 6 p.m. 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. I second on the amendment. Here. All right, discussion on the amendment. Council Rodon. Yeah, uh, this this was discussed in the Transportation Parking Commission. This very question, and. Um, you know, uh, the commission saw some value in 15-minute spaces after 6 p.m. Um, you may not have dry cleaners open at that hour, but you have takeout, for example. And I feel when you have 15-minute spaces, it effectively increases the amount of available parking because it lets people cycle through. So, you know, we made the affirmative decision to keep it. <coughs> after some after some discussion, we made the decision to keep it at. Um, 24 hours. However, it was not kind of a heart, the heart and soul of the debate. And so I think it's up for discussion whether we want to change that. I would just add that I think there is some value to looking to have these 15-minute spots in theory. And this is, again, very theoretical because there's, unless a police officer comes by and decides to ticket you for being in a 15-minute space, there is no parking enforcement um, after 6 p.m. But I think we should discuss also the, the possible value of extending it slightly beyond 6 o'clock. Um, other towns have it going to 8, even when most of the uh, meter parking ends at 6. Um, it would be nice 
to have the parking enforcement officer here to add to this discussion. Um, but I, that is, that's my general feeling on this. Councilor Shara and then Councilor Klein. How would we broadcast that the changes happen? Because it's, I think it's widely known that after six, you, you know, those become or considered regular spots. Um, as you point out, there's not someone going around and ticketing. So, but yeah. I mean, if I can answer, yeah. Um, it's a good question because right now, I mean, the, the genesis of these ordinances um, comes from the fact that, you know, the mayor and the DPW identified that you know, the, we don't specify in our code where the 15 minute spaces are. So I'm not sure that there is a, a rule about when they end technically. Um, I could be mistaken about that, but I, 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 like you, I have assumed that they ended at six currently, but I'm not sure that is a written policy anywhere. Perhaps it is. Well, Maybe well actually, the, this was an, uh, part of the problem was that this was established administratively, as you noted, mm -hmm. and not by approval from the council, and consequently, the police have not been enforcing it. It's only been park enforcement officers. The, uh, the police have said, the, the chief said since he didn't consider it actually mandated law that it was appropriate to uh, to enforce it under those circumstances. So historically, no one's been receiving tickets, to my knowledge, after certain hours, uh, after park enforcement officers no longer doing the work. Um, Just a, a brief, uh, when we established the 15-minute spots, it was with the understanding of the parking director at that time that parking enforcement ends at 6 p.m. Therefore, um, those those 15 minute spots, just like any other meter spots or anything else, become free parking for all. Councilor Klein, you were next. So. I think in the Transportation and Parking Commission, one of the things that came up was this, the issue of signage and how we convey this that, you know, no longer, because the signs don't actually okay. state that after six o'clock, in fact, it, they revert to, you know, as long as you want. And I think that the the reason for this um, legislation was in fact because we can't go, we're not gonna go and pay to replace all those signs to make it clear. So is, am I remembering that correctly? Um, I think you're correct that we discussed signage. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think the, the current signs are ambiguous. So it just says 15 minute parking. Um, it doesn't say at all times. I do recall uh, uh, Nancy Forrestal suggesting that that phrase would be useful, you know, if we, if we go with 24 hours to say at all times. Right, and that's what I remember um, because meters will say, you know, ends at whatever time, six o'clock, and so people exactly. are used to being able to find that information, and if they can't find that information on the 15 minute signs, then the understanding, I guess, is that it's 24 hours. Well, that's the discussion that I remember we had. <coughs> the Councilor Adams. I think that extending it to, um, to eight o'clock would be might be confusing, and, and if, if we're going to do that, maybe that should be part of the discussion of, you know, of, 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 of making some parking until eight o'clock. I mean, I, we, I know Councilor Freeman Daniels was a supporter of that, so I know that that's been uh, something that has been discussed and possibly could be discussed in the future. But I think, I think for now we should go with 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 the original intent, as Councilor Carney stated, which was that these would be treated like regular spots after after six. Now, the mayor, you were actually on transportation parking, I think, when the, no? Yeah. Um, I, the only thing I would say is I, I do think, um, well, what this issue of times and things will be looked at by the parking study that we're having done, because some communities do go later in the evening. Of course, you then have to hire staff to enforce it later in the evening, so it's, there's, there's an offsetting piece there. But, you know, I do think what Councillor O'Donnell says um, it has value in that some of these spots do serve even after six o'clock for people that need to run into CVS or to go to Goberry or to park to get takeout on Main Street. They're not just in front of daytime retail establishment. So um, it's interesting. I guess I guess we could I I we can certainly you the council can do it at once, but it might be it's an interesting thing for us to study how they're actually used. Um, and we could talk to some of the enforcement people about it. I, I frankly think it's probably the honor system that yes. most people go on. I mean, there's always the local folks who think, you know, well, they know no one's out ticketing, but I'd be willing to bet that there's sort of an honor system, that there's turnover in those spots, because um, I usually see them 
I usually see them open the two 15 minute spots at the head of Main Street, like where CVS and Gobri is, are usually open. They're usually, um, so, you know, I think it's part of a larger discussion because I don't think it's just for daytime convenience as well as, you know, it's also evening convenience. But I, so I, I don't know, I, I think the signs actually serve as keeping the honest people honest as a word in that. By and large, serve as a psychological deterrent in some level for long term parking, but it, I think the level of enforcement is pretty loose. And um, so we're actually, once again, talking about symbolism and the value of symbolism and, and what it imparts. Councilor Carney was next, and Councilor O'Donnell. Um, one other reason that I support my amendment is um, that there is an impending parking study that would be happening, and I, I think rather than change, I, I think ch this would be a significant change to make it, even though the signs say neither, they don't say all and they don't say, you know, 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. We were told when they were established by the parking director, parking is not enforced after 6 p.m. So it's understood, it's understood that any 15 minute par uh, parking spot is not enforced after 6 p.m. There may be some honor system, there may be some change, and if that were to happen, I think that we should leave it as is until such parking study or whatever may re recommend some other change. Meaning, when I say leave it as is, I mean with the amendment that I... Well, just a, in a clarification, of course, parking is enforced after six, not parking at the meters, but you can't park in front of a hydrant, you can't park in a handicapped space, you can't park on the sidewalk. I'm just, saying, I'm just saying what we were told at the time by the parking director in the establishment of these ones here to these ones here in the um which is actually what we're lot. trying to correct <laughs> the dysfunction the fact that that wasn't necessarily legitimate and we're trying to correct that so that's that's i mean my only concern there is we're actually we established a law without establishing a law and what we're trying to do is actually establish by law and make it clear so i don't disagree with the the reasoning in this at all i, I actually think that you you make a reasonable case I'm i just, just think saying that it's it would be helpful if they're consistent with all the meters which are 6 p.m to 8 a.m and then if there is a parking study that makes a, a case that makes a you know data-based case for changing that from 6 p.m to 8 p.m or all 24 hours i mean it seems ridiculous that at uh, 10 o'clock at night, you shouldn't be able to pull into a 15 minute spot and park there for two hours if you're going into Bishops or someplace else because not many people will use a 15 minute spot at 10, 10 p.m. So, uh, Council O'Donnell and then Council Adams. Um, I just have a, a couple points to offer. One is that um, I, I definitely hear this, this side of the argument, and I think it's, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, part, partially very much persuaded by it, if you can be partially very much persuaded. <laughs> um, I'm really talking on both sides of my mouth. Uh, but, um, but, but my point is I think it has some value. And um, however, it's sort of a moot point in a way since although, as, as Council President points out, uh, 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 the North End Police Department can give you a ticket for parking in a crosswalk or whatever, the, practically speaking, no one's ticketing after 6. So whether we set it at 6, or 6.30 in the law, it sort of is a moot point. So I could see going with six. Um, I'd also just like to add to the discussion that on this amendment, and I believe it's, it's Council Adams, it's your amendment, right? Or are there other two amendments on this? She, uh, she seconded, so. Okay, excuse me. So Council oh, Adams made it, you seconded it. Oh. Okay. But you both have authorship. You're, you're <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, our amendment. Um, I, to, to, add, to add to this, we should also put in the days of the week. Um, because I assume we would exclude Sunday. So that's another um, yeah. thing to, to add to this amendment if we go forward. But I, I do think that, I think the parking study will be um, revealing. I, I, I think I'm, I'm happy the mayor has, has done this. I think it's, it's worthwhile to have a holistic um, analysis of parking in the city. However, I would say, say for the record that I hope we take a serious look at possibly changing this because I think there is value in uh, extending the 15-minute spots because it, I, it will, by virtue of encouraging these um, spots to turn over, effectively create more parking in downtown Northampton, perhaps not to 10 p.m., but maybe to 8 or something. Um, I'd just like to point out, when we talk about administrative enforcement, um, I guess what we're saying is that the administration has decided to enforce something that 
is not a law. So that's, um, we can call it administrative enforcement, but really that's basically illegal ticketing. So I, j I just want to make that clear. Um, it, there has to be a law that allows for the ticketing. Mm -hmm. and, and I would also like to, um, I don't know how you want me to do this procedurally, a add, to, add to the amendment what Councilor O'Donnell said, which is this, this should apply from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. Monday yeah. through Saturday. That was a friendly amendment offered and it's accepted. Okay. Um, yeah, and just just for the record, since we're not going to be changing the signage pretty much as far as the public's concerned, for the most part, people are parking in the evening, nothing has changed. <laughs> so, I mean, essentially, what we've changed, I mean, for all practical intents and purposes, very little has changed in reality, only in codifying. Councilor Klein. I think. I think that's not a small point. I think the fact that we're not actually able to inform the citizens about any changes and the fact that we're about to have this, you know, mass parking study that's going to make decisions like these, that maybe we need to table this and, I mean, just not address it and remove it from the floor. I'm sorry. I was like... I, I appreciate I, I appreciate that that sentiment. Um, I wouldn't support tabling it. I think there's some value important. I think it's important to put it into the, the code of ordinances. Um, and Councilor Adams, right. Councilor okay. Adams touches on why. But I'd also like to say, um, when you say telling the public something has changed. I think the public assumes that these 15 minutes are are uh, spaces end at six. And Councilor Carney, you're you know when these were established, you have knowledge that they were intended to last to six, but I don't know. I've sometimes said, I'm not sure if I should park here. Now I know better. So being, being on the Transportation and Parking Commission, I know all these sneaky things I can do now. But, um, <laughs> but I think there's, I, I don't think it's necessarily a change in, in public opinion. I think there's some confusion, and uh, ultimately we should seek to clarify it. And it, it is more important, I think, to actually make this law in so that the current statutes can be enforced, as it's understood by the public already. They are enforceable. Councilor Rath. I was just going to say that point. It's important to get it correct in the codification, even though it doesn't really change the practice. But also, um, it's important that we can start legally ticketing people, which is which is your right. Point. Right. That's uh, Councilor. Rath. Oh, it's, I think it's also important because yes, we're going to do a study, but who knows when we're going to act on the study, if ever? I mean, there's bookcases of studies we've done that nothing ever came of it. So three parties. Who knows how long this would be enforced till? we actually get around to acting on whatever studies there but you know it is true you know the police ticket yeah, right. handicapped space violations uh, parking in no parking <clears throat> zones I mean because frankly it's illegal to park anywhere that isn't a marked parking space correct so if it isn't a marked parking space and you park there it's illegal that's what you drive away so in fact, it's been illegal to park in downtown Florence all these yeah, years. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 we won't say that because oh, that oh, ends up oh. as a headline. So <laughs> just, it's not. <laughs> we'll, the, uh, we'll just refer <laughs> those calls from Ward 5 and 7 to Council O'Donnell. So this, this discussion is on the amendment with, with, with a friendly amendment to, uh, adding on Sundays. So uh, we're still talking to the, to the amendments. Council O'Donnell. I was just going to move to limit debate to 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll withdraw my call motion. The, call the Snap. question. So the question's being called on. This is on the amendments. Yes. Uh, uh, call on the amendments? No. 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 Okay. no. no just asking. You know, all those in favor of the amendments, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And you do have the amendments. Do you, do you have those? I got them. <laughs> uh, now back move the, uh, to the order. Move the order. Well, it's already been. It's already mo okay. yeah, motions been made as amended. Uh, Is there any further discussion on the motion as amended? Can we, can we just move it? I hope not. Yeah. We move these together. So we did. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're going to be voting on both. We're going to be voting on both. Okay. Right. So make sure. when, when we queue up, when we get to that point, are we at that point? I hope yes. so. We are all at that point. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Speck. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Lubarge. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Pass in second reading, and once again showing the value of second reading. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Uh, the last up is the ordinance of violations and penalties to amend the fines for misuse of handicapped parking spaces. Uh, <coughs> all this increased fees. From 100 to 150 dollars. This is also from a recommendation, or a recommendation, positive recommendation from ordinance, 
I want to set, set the motion for the Second. Second. For the discussion on this item. Hearing none, roll call. Councilor Chair. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. <coughs> Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. <coughs> Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. O'Donnell. Yes. Pass and second reading is amended. Uh, no updates from me. Any committee chairs with uh, Councilor Murphy already uh, informed us about that? Trying to hearing. Uh, no information requests. Any new business? I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. second. Any discussion? No, you see no discussion on adjournment, so nice try. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you all very much. See you in November. Probably sooner. <laughs> Thank you.